Okay. Um, yeah, that's uh, that was one thing. And the next thing actually is the growing data space, which we um, uh, elaborate now. So um, yeah, we saw that the data space grows with increasing the increasing dimensionality, um, and we will also see that um, the data space grows. So in low dimensional space, if we have some have some assumptions on the behaviors uh, on the behavior of volumes and on the distribution of data objects, which are quite intuitive, but we will see that those assumptions and those properties actually do not hold anymore. Yeah, um, so. Spaces become sparse uh, um, or even empty, um, and the probability of one object inside a fixed range tends to become zero. That's maybe um, already clear, but we can um, just mathematically show that this, this is the case. And also, the distribution of the data has a strange behavior. For example, a normal distribution of, uh, has only few objects in its center, and the tails of the distributions become more important. So consider this one here. I mean, a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution, consider this one is like this Gaussian um, Glocke, yeah, where uh, you typically, all the points or the probability distribution um, becomes larger as 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 closer you get to the to the um, to the center to the mean of the distribution yeah and in high dimensional spaces it's the other way around so um, the probability that points are located close to the center is dramatically decreasing so the tails of the distributions um, uh, be now become more important yeah and um, this has some very strange, um, or this is a very strange and completely counterintuitive uh, property, uh, which has some high impacts on uh, methods that um, that uh, use these assumptions. That, um, for example, a Gaussian distribution always models um, uh, the fact that um, things around the mean are more likely than uh, things at the tails of the distribution or observations at the tails of the distributions. Yeah? So we will have a closer look on those issues now. So the growing space, um, uh, growing hypothesis space now, uh, just means that, okay, the more features we have, the larger the hypothesis uh, space is. So here in the one-dimensional space, uh, we have just a very small space. And if we add another dimension, we have the, 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 the space, the, the data space grows. Um, and it grows obviously exponential, yeah? so uh, exponential in d, yeah? to the power of d. So um, what does it mean? In in fact, uh, so the lower the uh, hypothesis space is, the easier typically it is to find a correct hypothesis. Uh, and very very important, the less examples you need to properly test hypothesis. So if you have a very complex hypothesis because you have a very high dimensional feature space you need much more examples to properly test this hypothesis now um, transform hypothesis into model if you have a model that explains some very very complex high dimensional thing uh, you need a lot of examples to really support um, this um, this model or to really have a, a train a, a stable model yeah. So, for example, consider a hyperplane. A hyperplane, in a one-dimensional case, is just a point. In two dimension, two dimensions, it's a line. In three dimensions, it's um, a hyper. It's a plane, a two-dimensional plane. So, consider in in uh, in um, in two dimensions, um, you need um, two points to define a line. Uh, a hyperplane uh, typically needs, in general, d plus one uh, points um, to form or to define this hyperplane in, in general in, 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 in d-dimensional space. So, um, and this is a very very simple model. This is a linear model, a line, a hyperplane is a very very simple model. But if d grows to say um, a thousand, you need a thousand plus one to really um, model or, or define even define um, a, a hyperplane, a linear model um, in in this um, in this um, feature space. Yeah? Um, and as I said, this is a very simple model. Um, you of course uh, can um, uh, consider very specific or more complex models where you need much more um, um, uh, uh, samples in order 
to uh, uh, train a stable model. So um, what does it mean here now for, um, um, for, for example, for a, a multivariate uh, distribution? So con consider F to be uh, a unit multivariate uh, normal distribution and normal uh, kernel. Uh, the aim is to find an estimate of F at the point zero. Yeah? And the relative mean square error should be fairly small, for example, um, point, point 0.1. Yeah? And now the question is how many samples do you need to achieve uh, to 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 really model this multivariate uh, um, uh, normal distribution to to uh, schätzen yeah to um, to model that to estimate this normal distribution with an R error less than point zero po uh, point 0.1 0 0.1 yeah so in one dimensional um, in a one dimensional um, uh, feature space you just need four samples okay easy in two dimensions, you already need 19. In five, you already need 700 something. In 10 dimensions, you need or you already need not not uh, close, but uh, nearly a million observations just to estimate a distribution, a normal distribution, uh, with an error less than 10%. Uh, yeah? I mean, one uh, 0 0.1. That's 10%. 10% error. Come on. Yeah. So even in 10 dimensions. You need a lot of samples to properly estimate a, a very simple form of distribution. Yeah? So, yeah, hard problem. Um, the growing space also have not only a growing hypothesis space, but you also have a lot of empty spaces, and uh, the, the impact on the tails distribution, tail uh, distribution is also huge. So consider this one here. Um, so if we have a d-dimensional space with partitions of context, uh, constant size, yeah? the number of cells, of course, increases exponentially. You probably know that. So the number of cells is m to the power of d. m is the um, number of, of, of uh, partitions uh, you, you spend along each attribute. Yeah? So if you just have one feature and you spend one, two, three, four um, um, cells, um, you have, okay, four cells. And then if you um, take four cells in each of the two dimension uh, two, dimension, uh, two dimensional space in the two dimensions here, you end up in four times four um, cells, two dimensional cells, which are sixteen. And um, in the three dimensional case, you have four times four times four. It's already sixty four, and so on and so on. Yeah? Now suppose you have in all those cases you um, place x points randomly in all those spaces x is fixed the number of points is fixed yeah in low dimensional spaces there are r just a few empty partitions or most of the partitions or actually all partitions are filled at least with some points um, and there are many partitions per points in high dimensional spaces of course still since we have far more partitions far more cells uh, um, there are many many empty partitions so set x for example to four and uh, just try to randomly spread that all over, you have a good chance that all of those four partitions get exactly one point. Now here, since you have 16 partitions and just four points, uh, uh, at least 12 partitions um, uh, will be empty. Yeah? And the same holds true here, at least 60 uh, partitions uh, will be empty here in this case, maybe even more. Yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, analogously, you can consider a simple partitioning scheme, uh, which splits the data in each partition into halves. Yeah, for d-dimensional uh, dimensions, of course. So we have a, a, a data space like like this one here, and you partition that uh, in two half uh, spaces. The same here. Yeah. Um, so uh, along each along each feature, of course. Yeah. So you get one partition here. In the two-dimensional case, you partition here and here. So you get four partitions. In the, the three-dimensional case, you split here, here, and here. So you get, again, um, 16 partitions. So it's, again, growing exponentially, obviously. Yeah? So for d dimensions, we obtain 2 to the power of d partitions. Now consider n um, is 10 to the, power, to the power of 6 samples in this space. Not too many, I would say. Yeah. So for d um, smaller than ten, such a partition may make sense. But uh, for d equals to one hundred, for example, there are around ten to the power of thirty partitions. 
Yeah, so now uh, you see you have just 10 to the power of 6 samples, and but you have 10 to the power of 30 partitions. So most of the partitions are empty, yeah? obviously. So these are very simple, let's say, mathematical examples, yeah, finger übungen maybe. Um, what is it? Finger practices. Uh, good. Um, but um, yeah, uh, that's how it is. Yeah? I like these uh, um, German sayings, word to word translations in, in English. Yeah? Uh, my favorite is if you want to go to the toilet, um, I have to go, uh, I, I go for little boys now. Yeah? Um, but don't say that to a, to a native speaker. They, they probably um, look at you a little, a little weird. So, anyway, so. Um, uh, empty spaces and tails. Now consider the tails uh, stuff. So we uh, will now uh, place a hypercube range query with length s in all dimensions into our data space somewhere. Yeah? So here is our data space which is for example between 1 and 0 in each uh, dimensions and we have uh, a hypercube range query with side length s. Yeah? Um, and now we say E is the event that an arbitrary point lies within this um, action, this um, uh, range query. Yeah? So the probability for this event is S to the power of D. So with increasing dimensionality, even very large hypercube range queries are not likely to contain any point. Yeah? And now consider all this density-based stuff and so, which, which use um, epsilon range queries. So the epsilon must be, must be much, uh, extremely large in order to find any point. So all of the points are either um, non-core points, meaning noise, or what? Yeah. And then take the other stuff with this um, um, concentration problem. So if you um, set your epsilon ranges um, in the high dimensional case too small, Nothing is in there. Um, so if you want to grasp at least one point, you have to set it extremely large, and then all of a sudden, all points are in the Epsilon neighborhood. Really strange, but that's how it is. Yeah? And you see the, uh, this, um, this effect again here um, uh, with different um, side length here. So even uh, so with side length 80%, um, 80% yeah? of the data space side length, even with 20 uh, in, in 20 dimensions, it's extremely unlikely to find anything in this in this uh, in this hypercube. Yeah? Sounds strange, but that's how the math uh, tells us. Yeah, that's what the math tells us. Yeah, and the same holds uh, true, of course, for uh, for spherical range queries. So instead of a, a cubical range query, you can also use, of course, a spherical range query. The same holds true. So the consequence is, with increasing dimensionality, the center of the hypercube or more generally, the center of the data space, becomes less important. And the volume of the data space concentrates on, uh, on, the, on the limits, on the, on its, in its corners. Yeah? So randomly distributed points tend to be on the border of the data space. Sounds extremely awkward, but that's how it is. So um, in two-dimensional case, that's extremely unintuitive, but points tend to be at the border of the data space in high dimensional case and the center is is empty it's just empty yeah that's really um strange um but actually that's how it is um yeah cut here